interest in pottery really begins in Georgia uh, after I moved uh, in 66 from Pennsylvania to Georgia. Uh, I met Lanier Meadows uh, up in the hills and uh, got interested in Meadows pottery and then Georgia folk pottery and then Southern folk pottery and more recently the world. Uh, so my latest book is called Global Clay, Themes and World Ceramic Traditions. But uh, my first trip to Britain would have been in 74, looking for connections with American pottery traditions and specifically the South. And I found some, uh, but I also was uh, fascinated uh, by uh, British pottery traditions uh, for themselves uh, and went back uh, six more times uh, looking at uh, museum collections and uh, visiting uh, pottery locations and uh, the few living uh, traditional potters who are still at work, so-called country potters, uh, as they are known in, in Britain. Uh, Peter Breers, a uh, great ceramics historian who has become a major expert on uh, food ways, English food, uh, in his first book, uh, The English Country Pottery, uh, estimated that in 1900, there were still 100 uh, country potteries that were active. Uh, when I started visiting uh, in the 70s, only four remained. Uh, and now, in terms of a real continuous tradition, there's only one, and I'll show you a little bit about that. So, Lake Holland uh, invited me to come to this uh, conference uh, to talk about the older uh, British pottery traditions that would have inspired some of the contemporary potters you have met uh, during this conference. Uh, and I should say that as a folklorist uh, whose research specialty is handcrafted pottery learned traditionally in a family or apprenticeship setting, uh, I'll be surveying these kinds of wares in England, Scotland, and Wales. Not the machine molded products at industrial factories that Mark has been speaking of, or the studio pottery arising out of the arts and crafts <coughs> that you've heard about. Uh, they have their own stories, as we know, uh, but they are also connected to the older tradition. So we'll begin in England uh, with its earthenware traditions, and at first we'll proceed chronologically. Starting with the prehistoric period, uh, the beaker folk of the early Bronze Age. Uh, and on the left, we're looking at a chalk burial uh, with an urn uh, at Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire, contemporary with the builders of Stonehenge. And on the right, uh, some hand -built, built collared urns from North Yorkshire. Roman period, the introduction of the potter's wheel. Uh, this is a tableau uh, in the Museum of London representing Romano-British uh, pottery, uh, a villa a kitchen of about uh, 100 AD uh, with wheel thrown kitchen wares. They did use some lead plates, uh, the Romans, uh, but not much. And even did some slip decorations. On the left, the vase with sprig molded gladiators, and the owners scratch the names of their favorite gladiators uh, at the top. Uh, and that's from the Roman center at Colchester in Essex, about 175 AD. I'm going to use the old uh, dating system. Uh, and on the right, a uh, Romano British cinerary urn, <coughs> face firm, also from Colchester, uh, about 100. A lot of these images come from museum collections. Then we get into the so-called Dark Ages. Uh, the potter's wheel was abandoned. The Anglo-Saxons uh, reverted to hand building. The 
swastika on that jar on the left, that Anglo-Saxon urn, was a good luck symbol. Uh, and eventually, of course, was adopted by the Nazis in the 20th century. Uh, it's from Norfolk and dates to about 500 AD. And then uh, a later wave of uh, people from uh, the continent uh, introduced lake glazes and the potter's wheel again. This pot on the right spouted jar is Sancho Norman, so called Stamford Ware in Lincolnshire, uh, and dates to about a thousand. Lead glaze and wheel thrown. Pot in the middle is one we've seen, you, you all have seen twice, I think, during this conference, but I think there's no harm in showing it again. So we're in the Middle Ages, and we're looking at uh, lead glazed earthenware on the left and center, uh, wheel thrown jugs, uh, Dartford night jug on the left from Scarborough, Yorkshire, about 1300. Uh, the middle jug is from Mill Green, Essex. Early 1300s, the green color comes, as you, I'm sure, know, from copper oxide and under or in the lead glaze. Uh, notice that thumbed face, uh, which is a distinctive feature of some medieval pottery. And compare that form with the jug at the far right. Can you guess who made that? That's Bernard Lee. Uh, at St. Ives uh, in the 1960s. And so he's borrowing a medieval English form, uh, but adding uh, his Japanese connection uh, with ash glazed stoneware. Figural jugs uh, were pretty common in the Middle Ages. Uh, on the left, a three faced so called Coventry jug from Nuneaton in Warwickshire, 14th century. And two others are by different potters of Kingston upon Thames and Surrey, both early 1300s. Very different approaches to the human figure, but from the same area, from the same time period. These are aquamaniles. Uh, they were filled with water and put on the table. There were not a lot of eating forks in those days. Uh, you had a spoon for soup, you had a knife for cutting meat, uh, but forks were mostly used in the cooking process rather than the eating, and so your hands picking up the joints of meat would get very greasy and messy, and so there was a place on the table where the uh, water containers would allow you to rinse your hands periodically and make sure there was a towel that went along with it. These are uh, from Scarborough in Yorkshire, they do about 1300 uh, in the shape of, of rams. And then we get into the Renaissance period. Uh, border wear, uh, two examples uh, from the Surrey Hampshire border. On the left, the hot water cistern with the arms of Henry VII and his queen Elizabeth of York, probably made for one of the royal palaces, dating to about 1500. And on the right, Handle Scots with Tudor Rose and the initials ER for Elizabeth I, later 1500s. So called Cistercian blackwares, uh, lead glazed earthenware with manganese dioxide and possibly some iron oxide in the glaze to give it that kind of lustrous uh, dark brown or purplish black uh, color. Uh, and these are both from Staffordshire uh, and represent the, the tradition that preceded the slip decorated tradition uh, that would evolve into the industrial property that Mark has been talking about. Uh, on the left, a tig or multi handled drinking vessel, uh, and on the right, a posset pot. Posset is a, a spiced drink of hot, sweetened milk curdled with wine or ale. Uh, and many handles so you can pass this around the table and drink communally from it. So-called Cistercian because they were often found by archaeologists at Cistercian monastery sites. <coughs> it's an 
as the monks like to drink, just like the rest of us. Uh, some good examples of the work of Thomas Toft, probably the most celebrated of all of the slipware potters of North Staffordshire. Uh, his famous uh, mermaid plate on the left uh, and the plate for the royal arms on the right, representing the restoration period when Charles II uh, was, uh, became king. And the Loving Cup by Thomas Toft. I think it's the only one that can be attributed to him very clearly since he signed it. And an owl jug uh, with the feather slip technique uh, attributed to Toft, but with some debate about who, which of the Staffordshire potters made these. There are about a dozen of them that I know of in, in collection. <laughs> Museums and private collections dating to the late 1600s. Another tradition in England was that of tin glazed earthenware, or so called Delftware, uh, that was introduced to England from the Netherlands. And on the left, the earliest dating example, uh, 1600, attributed to Antwerp potters uh, Jasper Andries and uh, Jacob Janssen who were working at Aldgate in London, and then on the right, uh, an Adam and Eve plate uh, of 1635 uh, from the Pickle Herring pottery of uh, Southwark, which is, I understand, for now Southwark uh, in London, uh, dated 1635. And these are trick drinking vessels. Uh, we've learned about the puzzle jug uh, there on the right. That's a good early English example. Would have had a hole uh, at the underside of the top of the handle. Uh, that was the trick that we had to discover. And you would suck the liquid out from the bottom through the hollow handle and the hollow end. Uh, and then the uh, other piece is another type of trick drinking vessel called. A uh, fuddling cup or jolly boys. Uh, and so you fill all three, of, sometimes they had more than three compartments. They were all interconnected, they communicated with each other through holes in the body. And so you'd think you'd be drinking just one of those, but as you drain the first one, uh, the other two would fill that one, and you have to keep drinking until the whole thing was empty. <coughs> Now we'll look at some pottery centers, uh, historical pottery centers, uh, starting with Western England. This is North Devon, uh, the towns of Barnstaple, Biddeford, and Fremington. Uh, Scratido tradition, uh, introduced to England from <coughs> France and the Netherlands, concentrated in the West Country, but we'll see that this technique made its way to Scotland as well, both on the west coast and east coast. Uh, and a posset pot on the left from Barnstable, 1682, and a christening cradle, 1698. So presumably, uh, the parents of a new uh, child would go to a local potter and commission a cradle. Sometimes it had uh, the infant's name on it, it's often dated, this one is dated. You can see the initials uh, of the, presumably the child that was made for SD on the right. Uh, it's dated 1698. So this was a kind of gift that uh, would be a memento of one's christening. Harvest jokes uh, for cider or ale uh, from North Devon. Uh, for the harvest home celebration, the, the, the farm owner will host for his farm workers at the end of the harvest. Uh, and the one on the left is by John Leachelin, uh, Barnstable, 1669. Uh, and then the one on the right of the Royal Arms, uh, actually assigned by two different people. Uh, Edward Reed was the potter, 
and Thomas Stoneman was the decorator. Uh, and that's also from Barnstable and his dated 1741. The pot poem on the piece on the right uh, that is inscribed uh, Scrapino uh, style uh, around the shoulder uh, reads, uh, come fill me full with liquor sweet, for that is good when friends do meet. Another West Country Scrafino Center was Donyat in Somerset. And this is a Scrafino plate uh, using a tulip, a tulip uh, design to create the image of uh, women, three females, uh, 1685. And a puzzle jug on the left uh, with a very distinctive, almost vertical spout typical of Donyak. This is an 1806 dated example by John Martin, and then a fuddling cup uh, from Donyak on the right, uh, dated 1770. And now we move to southern England, Sussex. They an interesting variety of earthen wares. Uh, they use the technique of slip inlaying, where they would stamp in the damp clay of the pot Printers type and dies, uh, and then cover the whole thing with slip, and then scrape the slip off the raised surface, leaving the slip in the impressed part of the, the design itself. Uh, that pocket flask is from Chaley in Sussex, uh, 1797, and a picture uh, in hop ware. Hops were grown locally in that part of England. Uh, for beer uh, brewing, uh, first as a preserve, and, and then people acquired the taste for it. Uh, and so the local potters took advantage of the interest in hops by making this series uh, called Hop the Hopware Series. That example is from the Bellevue Pottery and is dated uh, 1899. That pottery was a dry in the Sussex. Uh, pig flats. Sussex potter specialized in these. Uh, they were made so that the rear was flat. You could sit it up on its haunches, fill it with beer, <laughs> remove the head, and use that as a drinking cup. And this was just a kind of fun item to, to show off uh, in your living room, your parlor, or maybe in a local uh, tavern. This one is a tribute to Frederick Mitchell nearby in the 1850s, and it's an early example. And it's, I guess it's got manganese uh, sprinkled on the damp clay and then uh, the lays over that. The, the phrase that you sometimes see on these is, uh, he wouldn't be drawled, he wouldn't be driven, pig-headed, stubborn. And I guess that's what potters identify themselves. This is a group of agate ware pieces uh, from the Burgess Hill pottery of Sussex, 19th century. Um, Scrottle ware, as it was called, uh, here in North Carolina in the Catawba Valley, the same basic technique is called uh, squirrel ware, as you know, some of you. And that uh, mug on the left probably has a frog at the bottom in clay, which is a kind of trick. And the chamber pot on the right, you can see part of it has a face. <laughs> Staring up at you when you're in the business. Now we go to Rudum, which is spelled like Rotham, W-R-O-T-H-M-A-N, but pronounced Rudum in Kent in the southeast. And that's a Tig or loving cup on the left by John Livermore, dated 1649. And in Rudum, uh, the potters were very skilled at slip trailing and applying a sprig uh, in, in contrasting colored clay uh, pads with, with designs on them, including dates and initials of the potters. Uh, and so the candlestick was made by George Richardson in 1651. And another pottery center, uh, 
was in Harlem, uh, in Essex, not far from London. Uh, and so a lot of these wares have turned up in the metropolitan London area, and they're referred to as metropolitan slipwares. Uh, and the jump on the left has an inscription that says, the gift is small, goodwill is all, and this you see, remember me, be merry and wise. Now, I'm puzzled about that last part of the inscription, because you see that frequently uh, on English pottery from the 17th and 18th century. What does it mean, be merry and wise? Any guesses? I think that's basically it. Drink in moderation. Enjoy yourself while you're drinking, but don't, don't drink to excess. That's my guess. You may have other thoughts. And a plate, a uh, slip tray of plate, uh, dated 1632. Let me go to Northern England. And a, a form, kind of peculiarly English or British form, I should say, because we find it in Scotland as well, a salt kick, uh, known also as a salt pig or, or salt crop up in Scotland. Uh, this is uh, Cumbria and the Lake District. Uh, from the Weatherix pottery, the early example on the left um, by uh, the Schofield and Thorburn family, dated 1897, clearly made as a presentation piece uh, with a Scrofido inscription on the front uh, for the, the family it was made for, for and the date. And then all of the, the kind of traditional slip trail and design motifs uh, of that part of England. And then on the right, a salt kit by Jonathan Snell, who was a young artist who bought the pottery when it was offered for sale uh, under the condition that he would train for a year under the retiring potter uh, and became quite skilled at the local uh, technique, um, created something like an art colony there at Witheridge, uh, and then eventually moved on and place changed hands. And is pretty well, no, no longer a pottery operation that way. Uh, how do you think that piece was made? I belong. Any guesses? Yeah, it was thrown in two sections. A hole was left on the shoulder, big one, and then the hood was thrown separately and looted her attached to around the hole, and that was kept in the kitchen, filled with salt, uh, and it sort of kept the salt dry in a, in a humid environment, uh, and so the cook would just reach in there and grab a pinch or a handful of salt and use it in her, her stew or her soup, whatever. Uh, a lot of them have a flat back so that they could be hung up on the wall of the kitchen, but I think they were also made just for display. So now we're in Yorkshire, and we're looking at puzzle jugs. The one on the left by John Wedgwood uh, from Staffordshire, but moved to Yorkshire. He was the great uncle of Josiah Wedgwood. The Wedgwood family goes way back in the pottery track. Uh, and this particular Wedgwood uh, moved to Yearsley in Yorkshire, and this Puzzle job is dated 1691. And then the one on the right is from Burton in Lonsdale, uh, dated 1831, along the top of the handle, uh, with the traditional uh, challenge in uh, rhyme. Uh, Gentlemen, now try your skill. I'll hold you six pence if you will, if you don't drink unless you spill. And again, the secret is to find that hole. Uh, under the top of the handle, but also uh, complicating things is that you had to close off three of the four spouts before you could get the suction in from the remaining spout. <laughs> so if you're the kind of person who can't walk and chew gum at the same time, you have trouble drinking that without spilling it all over your shirt. At the Halifax area, that was a big pottery center, too. And these are Wiston cuckoo mantle ornaments 
on the left, uh, let's watch some part, sometimes called a treacle glaze. It's a lead glaze with iron or manganese uh, kind of flowing down, uh, probably by the Woodenham House pottery uh, of about 1880. And then on the right, a different operation uh, in the Halifax area, soil hill pottery, a slip trail uh, from the mid 1800s or a little later. Speaking of Halifax, these are cider jugs uh, for fermenting cider, making car cider, uh, glazed halfway outside. And uh, it was explained to me that that was intentional, uh, that the lower uh, wall uh, was slightly porous and it would cause some evaporation, which would cause the fermenting cider to roll around inside. Uh, and speed up the fermentation process. Uh, and the one on the left is from the 19th century uh, with a manganese colored lead glaze. Uh, notice the, the loop handles, vertical loop handles. Little hole um, below the neck is for a little hand little stick that would allow the gases to escape uh, and then would pop back down to prevent uh, air Bacteria contaminating this liquid and turning it into a vinegar. Uh, but the one on the right was made by Isaac Button at Soil Hill Pottery uh, in the mid 20th century, and he preferred cider jugs with these lug or slab handles. And there is Isaac at Soil Hill Pottery, 1965. Some of you may have seen the film uh, that was done about him showing him working at various processes, but he's carrying uh, pensions or pans uh, and then uh, slipping uh, bowls or pans uh, inside the shop as well. Uh, and a lot of uh, a later generation of English potter uh, really looked to him as inspiration. Uh, puzzle job on the left, a scrapio, a poetic challenge again. Let's see if I can reconstruct that one. From Mother Earth, I claim my birth. I made a joke for man, but now I'm here, filled with good cheer. Come taste me if you can. Uh, and that's by Isaac Button. Uh, and there on the right, some of you may know John Hudson, uh, Muirfield in West Yorkshire, uh, maker historical reproductions, who half seriously believes that he's a reincarnation of Thomas Toft. Uh, and he's got very proudly displaying his Isaac Button apprentice puzzle jug, dated 1925, which he had recently purchased in for his collection. Now this is the living tradition in Yorkshire, the Littlethorpe pottery of Wickham in North Yorkshire. Ripon is a town where they have had a thousand year old civil ceremony. Uh, the uh, horn blower uh, comes out of this little place, uh, ceremonially dressed uh, with a great big horn at nine o'clock to blow curfew, and that's been going on for about a thousand years uh, every night. So uh, just outside of Ripon, this little dark pottery. Established in 1831, and that's Roly Curtis at the wheel in 1991. Uh, one of England's last folk potters, probably the last. I think that's debatable. Notice uh, the brand of shoe that he's wearing, the tennis shoe that he's wearing, high tech. Uh, that might seem ironic given that he's one of the last traditional potters still working at the the wheel he's working on was a steam powered uh, potter's wheel, very advanced for its day, uh, converted to electric power, uh, and uh, with a uh, cone technique that can adjust the speed of, of the wheel. And there on the right uh, is the kind of work that he does, uh, horticultural wares for the most part, uh, but a few red crops as well, glazed inside with lead silicate.
Uh, but there was a stoneware tradition, a salt-laced stoneware. And this tradition began with uh, German potters uh, moving to England uh, in the mid-17th century. And they, these are both examples of uh, Bartmann's Krugen, uh, bearded man jugs in England called Bellarmines, because they were mistaken, uh, the belief to be caricatures of Cardinal Bellarmino. Um, but uh, the one on the left was from Woolwich, uh, Woolwich near London, uh, and dated to about 1660. Uh, you can see the medallion on the belly is a guy with a mug who has apparently been drinking in the tavern. Uh, and the one on the right is attributed to a German potter named Simon, Simon Multus, uh, working at William Killebrew's pottery in Southampton. Uh, and that's dated about 1670. But the first long-term or successful stoneware operation in England was the John Dwight pottery at Fulham, uh, which is now part of metropolitan London. Uh, and that's the uh, Fulham Pottery Delamine uh, on the left, made about 1675. And I believe the medallion on the belly is supposed to represent his daughter, Lydia. And we'll see a bit more about her shortly. Uh, on the right, uh, Dwight had apparently hired uh, maybe two different sculptors uh, to make uh, busts of people uh, and uh, other images in stoneware clay and salt glazing, and that's a portrait of John Dwight himself uh, by the sculptor who was working in his shop then, uh, dated uh, to about 1674. But this is Dwight's daughter, Lydia, this death effigy. Uh, and uh, it's really one of the most moving images in clay I've ever seen. Uh, in the V&A, is that right, v &A? Uh, and And uh, it's dated 1674, uh, and it's only 10 inches high, but it's an extremely powerful image. Here are some Dwight Pottery wares. Uh, he's doing some interesting experimentation, a jug, to use the American name for that type of vessel on the left, uh, plied with variegated covered uh, slips uh, and uh, figures that have been sprigged onto the surface of the pot uh, in contrasting colored clay from brass molds. Those molds have survived. In, uh, I think the British Museum collection, uh, and that dates to about 1690, uh, a coffee pot two-tone coffee pot, the upper half uh, washed with uh, an iron uh, slurry, uh, salt clay stoneware, looking very modern, doesn't it? Uh, kind of side, side handle coffee pot in salt clay stoneware. And then the tankard on the right was made after Dwight's death uh, at his pottery. It's dated 1724. And that became kind of the model, that two-tone look uh, became the model for a lot of stoneware coming out of London uh, in the uh, late 18th century and into the 19th century. Now we're in Staffordshire, uh, and this was, you know, as Staffordshire was beginning to pick up steam as an industrial center, but still a lot of hand work, uh, and we're looking at the tradition of white salt glaze stoneware. Uh, they added a flint to the clay to help whiten it, uh, stoneware clay, uh, and uh, sometimes coated it with white slip as well for greater contrast uh, for the darker uh, decoration. And these are so-called pew groups. Uh, the one on the left is really a pew group. It's uh, three, three people uh, sitting in church. A poor woman is kind of stuck between uh, snuff takers. Uh, got their snuff boxes out of their pockets and they're uh, uh, sniffing snuff. Uh, and she is doing her best to listen to the, uh, pat, uh, the parson. Uh, 
and a sermon. And then on the one on the right, of course, is the Adam and Eve uh, image, uh, which is quite nice. A little hard to tell who is Adam and who is Eve. <laughs> Staffordshire using the scratch blue technique. So scratching designs, um, filling that with cobalt blue, scraping any cobalt off the outer surface uh, that didn't get into the uh, decoration. Uh, and a puzzle jug on the left uh, and a loving cup on the right, both made about 1760. So we're getting into the mechanical period of Staffordshire, uh, where their uh, engine turning, uh, lathe turning, um, pieces that may have been shaped on the potter's wheel, but then thinning the wall and the finishing shape, at least for that piece on the right. They're using some molds as well. Not in hand, brown salt lace stoneware tradition here. Beginning with James Morley's pottery, uh, who had apparently infringed on John Wright's patent uh, for stoneware, and there were legal cases about this. Um, his pieces from the early period, uh, of about 1700, uh, were uh, distinctly double walled, uh, and the outer wall was reticulated, but patterns were cut through. Uh, but the piece, the inner wall, of course, still held the liquid. And that one on the left is the mayor's posset pot from Nottingham. Uh, and the uh, mug on the right, that shape is called a gorge, a gorge. Uh, and it has that spherical body. Uh, a puzzle jug from Nottingham on the left. Dated 1755, with a little color added to it, and a bear baiting jug on the right of about 1750. This was a big sport, uh, quote unquote, uh, of 17th and 18th century England. Uh, continued until the cruelty to animals act was passed later. Uh, Bear baiting still goes on in South Carolina, isn't it? illegally. Uh, but this would have been in a tavern, uh, and uh, the audience for a bear baiting contest would have come in for a drink and gotten from this kind of vessel. And a related uh, brown salt lay stoneware tradition uh, of Derbyshire, uh, not far from. Nottingham, uh, a molded Toby jug on the left, taking off on the earthenware Toby jugs of Staffordshire from the late 1700s. Uh, this one from the 1850s, from Old Fields pottery, and then a molded uh, puzzle jug on the right that still involved a good deal of handwork, uh, but the body of it at least uh, coming out of a mold. And a couple of other stoneware traditions to show you that there were other parts of England that had yet another version of uh, stoneware. Uh, on the left, a brown salt glaze uh, stoneware. Well, what would be called a flagon or bottle in Britain, but what we would call a jug. Uh, from the Liverpool area, Merseyside, 1840s, very much like our southern syrup jug. Uh, and of the same time period, uh, related to the anti bellum syrup drugs made in uh, the Carolinas and Georgia. Uh, and then on the right, uh, two different um, fountains, <coughs> pitcher form fountains that would have been used for, there would have been a uh, spigot at the bottom, uh, for beer perhaps in a tavern, uh, and the one at the top, uh, dated 1840, 1844, wait a minute, 1834, brown salt glaze stoneware with a lot of sprig molded decoration on the surface, 
And then below that, uh, 1844, and you see that they have switched to using a Bristol glaze, which was developed at Powell's Pottery uh, about 1835. Uh, and so they, they shifted from salt glaze to Bristol glazed stoneware, but still with that with a two-tone effect, the iron wash on the upper half. And some of you may know Bristol glaze here in the United States. It was introduced for stoneware, mostly industrial stoneware, in the late 19th century. Now we're in Scotland. Uh, and on the left, uh, a uh, crock, craga, as it's called uh, in Gaelic, of Barvis ware. Uh, these were hand-built uh, pots from the Hebrides, uh, the Western Isles of Scotland, earthenware, uh, peat fire on the, on the fireplace, uh, very uh, soft and porous, almost prehistoric looking. Uh, that example is from uh, the Isle of Lewis, uh, and it was made in the 1880s, but it, you know, it could fool some archaeologists, I think, into thinking that it was made in the prehistoric period. Uh, and then on the right, lead glazed wheel thrown jug from Frost in Stirlingshire, dated to the 1600s. And there was a scrappy tradition in Scotland. Uh, the commemorative plate for a betrothal on the left. Uh, made at Morrison's Haven Preston Pans Pottery in 1773. That's from the east coast of Scotland near Edinburgh. And the jug on the right uh, from the Cumlick Pottery in Ayrshire, southwestern Scotland, Burns country, uh, dated 1801. Just a few years after the Cumlick Pottery opened and continued in operation into the early 20th century with a scrappy inscription on it uh, for a local person. There on the left, a very elaborate salt bucket uh, or salt kit uh, presentation piece uh, dated 1892 uh, for someone living in Cumnock uh, with uh, sprig molded white clay acanthus, acanthus leaves on the sides and a cuckoo sitting on a nest at the top, uh, and then a bowl by the potter who was working at Cumnock uh, in 1874 for his wife, uh, to give to his wife a uh, very distinctive scrappy decoration, uh, but echoed by East Coast Scottish potters uh, in the scrappy tradition. Uh, the one on the left with cobalt blue added from Dryley's Pottery uh, of Montrose, dated 1866, and the one on the right from Seaton Pottery at Aberdeen, uh, dated 1890. And if I had time, I'd show you a whole range of wares made at Seaton Pottery. Uh, amazing stuff, but that's a good example of their Scrafito tradition. And Scottish stoneware, uh, a tree stump a grave marker for a gamekeeper who died in 1868 in Alloway, Alloway Kirk Cemetery, uh, where Robert Burns' father, William, is buried. Uh, I've seen references to this by people thinking this is stone, but it's actually brown salt glazed stoneware molded, uh, possibly in Glasgow. Uh, a jug in the middle, kind of semi industrial, uh, with a Bristol glaze. Uh, from Glasgow made for an Inverness hotel, and a distinctive whiskey bottle molded on the right uh, in the shape of a Masonic setting mall uh, for uh, Freemasons. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's from the Glasgow or Edinburgh area. And our last British country, Wales. And we're back to Buckley. Mark has talked about it. There were two important pottery centers in Wales, Buckley in the north and in Flintshire uh, on the left, an early posset pot 
uh, Brook Hill pottery in the 1650s, uh, pretty crude, uh, but some of what you might see as flaws are just from having been buried in an archaeological site and then rather badly restored uh, the, the fragments. Uh, and then on the right, a puzzle jug from Powell's pottery uh, of about 1900. And the emphasis, they used a lot of manganese colored lead glaze at Buckley. Typical Welsh milk rocks, partly glazed outside and fully inside with uh, manganese colored lead glaze uh, dating to about 1900 and virtually identical to the milk crops that we've seen in Ireland. Uh, and so it's very difficult to sort out what is a Welsh or an Irish milk crop in this style. But you North Carolina potters may recognize this as an important shape for milk crops in North Carolina, both in the Seagrove area around here, but also in Salt Lake stoneware, but also in ash place somewhere in the talk about further west. Uh, a cider jar from Buckley on the left with slip trailing around the shoulder, late 1800s, and a tobacco jar with a scratch inscription uh, of about 1900, uh, rusticated to look like tree bark, <coughs> scratched with a comb-like tool. And at the top, Buckley, uh, baking pans, or loaf, uh, molded loaf pans uh, with uh, slip trail uh, inscriptions indicating their function, what they were used for, uh, or to be used for, uh, of about 1900, and a fiddle uh, with an adequate uh, earthenware body, two different colors of clay, probably from Buckley, but found in Chester. Uh, and it's in the Glacier Collection at the Fitzwilliam Museum, uh, which has an amazing collection of English country pottery, most of which is in storage. So you'd have to make an appointment with one of the keepers to, to see what they have in storage. And they, they're very uh, fussy about photographs, so you have to fill out uh, duplicates of forms uh, to make that one photograph that I took of that, that one piece. And the second <coughs> pottery center for Wales is at Uwenny in Glamorganshire in South Wales. Uh, on the left, an historic photograph of the Clay Pits pottery uh, kiln uh, with Evan Jones and William Jenkins II, a uh, photo of about 1910. And on the right, uh, the Uwenny pottery uh, recently, a part of the Uwenny, Uwenny pottery uh, the older works have been moved to the Welsh, what used to be called the Welsh Folk Museum. It is now the National Museum of <coughs> Wales at uh, St. Fabian's uh, outside of Cardiff. And they have a nice collection of um, both Buckley and um, uh, Uene pots. And here are some puzzle jokes from Uene, the one on the left dated 18, 1720. It has that same tulip motif we saw at Donyak, possibly a Donyak potter coming down uh, there to work. Uh, and the one in the middle uh, from the Bridge End pottery in 1822. And then the one on the right by Thomas Arthur of Clay Pits pottery, 1830. Each with a very different approach to shaping and decorating. And so wassail bowls, these were a specialty of the UNA potters uh, for Christmas punch, uh, for the uh, Mary Lloyd ceremony, midwinter luck bringing ceremony where people would go around. Uh, there was a hobby horse. Uh, uh, the horse's uh, head was a skull. And they'd go from house to house. They'd sing a song. It was a very ritualistic activity. And then they'd be invited inside uh, for punch uh, and uh, uh, drink the punch from these bowls that were elaborately decorated using the sprechito technique and a lot of applied decoration and 
sometimes colorful. And the one on the left was by Thomas Arthur, Claybitz Pottery, 1835. The one on the right by Evan Jones of Claybitz Pottery, about 1910. And this is a cat doorstop from UNA Pottery, about 1908 on the left, still with some scraffito decoration. And then that's Caitlin Jenkins, eighth generation UNA Potter, uh, who has made a reproduction of a UNA Wassail bowl for uh, a gift to Prince Charles when he was about to visit UNA in 2013. And to conclude, me at Little Thorpe's uh, clay diggings in 1976, uh, starting pretty much when I, when I first was visiting uh, Rick. Thank you.